93, I was still in high school. I was working in a genetics laboratory in a hospital in New York City, and it was a time when amniocentesis was first becoming common for older women who had pregnancies. Now, my job was to look at fetal cells and check the chromosomes. And chromosomes come in pairs. But every once in a while, I would count and find an odd number of chromosomes. And it would tell me that pretty soon the doctor would be telling her that she was going to have a baby with Down syndrome. And it was a time when children with Down syndrome were often just hidden away. Other women simply ended their pregnancies. And so it was perfectly normal that people would start wondering, with the advent of genetic screening, are we going to become impatient with imperfection? Are we, as parents, going to begin seeing our children as commodities instead of as gifts. And remember, this was not very long after World War II, with all of the horrors of the Nazi eugenics programs. But I'm here to tell you tonight that, surprising or not, that didn't happen. And in fact, we've now had 50 years of responsible and useful advances in genetic screening and genetic testing, and now most recently the possibility of genetic treatment and it's time for us to maybe lose some of our concerns and lose some of our fears and look forward to the future. Now, to do that, I think it's time to ask some different questions. Not whether parents are going to stop thinking about their children as gifts, but rather, how much do we really understand about the way genetics really controls our personal identities and what it means to be human? And second, for the fears that we have, are those fears realistic, or are they perhaps somewhat or even occasionally wildly exaggerated? And then the third question being, what's the role of the government in prohibiting or promoting these technologies that have caused such great public concern over the last few decades? Now, I'm not going to try to say that our fears are totally groundless. Absolutely not. We know that there were horrendous abuses as early, I mean, as recently as the 1970s, when children with Downs were sometimes denied care for perfectly correctable medical conditions and instead left to die. But we've moved on since then. Amniocentesis gave way to other kinds of genetic screening during pregnancy, screening that was earlier and easier and safer, to the point where today we have screening that's not even invasive, it's a simple blood test. And yet, despite that fact, there are many people who just don't bother to use these tests. They prefer to find out what is nature going to do. And even for those who use the tests, not everybody responds the same way. Some people get news that there is a problematic trait, and they don't terminate the pregnancy. So we have a wide variety of responses to a wide variety of situations. And that tells me that we have not moved to some uniformly eugenic society simply because information is now available. Now, in the 1980s and 90s, another development came on the scene called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Now, this was something that could be done even before pregnancy, even before you had a fetus. Now, an embryo sitting outside the body that had been created through in vitro fertilization could be biopsied, and the physician could tell you if this embryo had a trait that would result in a child with some devastating disease. And again, there were concerns that this was going to lead to some kind of eugenic tendency among us. Indeed, just like in the 1970s, there were calls to prohibit the technology because of fears that now everybody would rush to do in vitro fertilization, even if they could conceive naturally, just so they could have the embryo outside the body and diagnose it for any number of trivial things or for diseases that might not occur until late in life. But what actually happened? What actually happened is that people who use IVF are people who, in fact, are infertile and need it in order to conceive, or do this because they really fear a devastating disease in their family, something like Tay-Sachs disease, which will take your child away before the child even makes it to kindergarten. It wasn't for frivolous purposes, and we didn't rush to use these things. So once again, we had seen that in action, the choices that people made, 
And the services that physicians offered were responsible and measured and did not necessarily doom us to some kind of eugenic destiny. So where does that leave us? Today, we have yet another genetic technology, gene editing. You've probably heard about it in the newspapers. Now, it goes beyond the possibility of being able to screen or test. With gene editing, you can actually reach in and change a gene. You can correct it, you can remove it, you can silence it, you can substitute in a healthy genetic sequence. All of these things are already being studied for things like muscular dystrophy or cancer or blindness. And yet, again, the advent of a technology that now offers not just screening and choices, but actual control, resulted in the same set of concerns and the same set of uh, calls for prohibitions and restrictions. The concerns being that now we were going to use this control not just to try and prevent or treat a serious disease, but instead to try and enhance ourselves, take a perfectly ordinary trait and make it super ordinary, perfect. And magnifying that concern about enhancement was the realization that this could also potentially be done not just in an adult or a child, but it could be done in the so-called germline. That means changing the genes in the egg or the sperm or the embryo. Because if you do that, you not only could remove what could be a devastating genetic disorder so that the resulting child is free of that particular problem, but that child's own children in the future, and grandchildren and descendants, and all the way down the generations would also be free of that trait. So that your change that you make today in that embryo or in those gametes would reverberate down the generations, both its benefits and, frankly, also its risks. Now, adding to that the concerns that we were now going to use these things not to try and avoid serious diseases, but to somehow enhance ourselves or use it for frivolous purposes, immediately there were serious discussions in newspapers and in journals and in magazines about the prospect of a super race and the division of humanity into classes of the engineered and the unengineered. And based on this kind of fear and speculation, we have countries around the world that have already criminalized germline editing. And that's even though it's unlikely that even if it ever actually is safe and effective enough to try with people, unlikely that it will be needed by more than just a handful, given all the other ways we now have to try and increase the chances of having a child free of serious disease. So it always makes me wonder why. Why, after 50 years of experience with genetic screening and amniocentesis, with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and the choice among embryos, why are we having exactly the same conversation? Why are the magazine covers still running the same picture of this theoretically designed baby and asking whether parents will no longer be able to love their children because they'll view them as commodities and products rather than as people? I can't be sure, but I suspect part of it is that we tend to overestimate the role that genetics plays in shaping our personal identities. Now, I'm not trying to say that genes are unimportant, only that sometimes we forget that they're only one component of things that we really value, and we assume that they are truly our destiny. For example, let's take sex and sports. Genes don't tell us whether you should be playing on the men's team or the women's team in the Olympics. Because there are people who have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So they're chromosomally male, but their bodies don't respond to testosterone in an ordinary way, and so their muscles and other things, they, they develop more like that of a typical female. So the genes don't tell us which team they should be playing on, men's or women's. Or race. Race is also not something that is a genetic phenomenon. It's a social construct. Somebody who's called black in America can be called white in another country with everything that those labels entail. And when you look at genetic variation, it's often greater within what we call a racial group than it is as between two different so-called racial groups. So genes don't, genes don't control 
our racial categories or our ethnic categories either. Maybe the next example should be family, because at least there it seems pretty clear, right, that genetics tells us who our family members are and to whom we are related. And yet, if you look at things like artificial insemination by sperm donor, you see that even there it's not quite true. You know, if you have a sperm donor, in most of the United States, that man's name does not appear on the birth certificate. That sperm donor is not considered to be the legal father of the child. That child's parents are the people who go home with that child and raise that child, not the sperm donor. Even though we know to a certainty that one or more of the parents are not genetically related. Why is it that the law does this? Because it recognizes that the family is a social group as much or sometimes even more than a genetic and biological group. So we see all of these examples where we recognize that genetics doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Now again, am I saying that genes are unimportant? No. They have tremendous influence. But I do think we can learn some lessons from our history and from these examples. And that is that we don't have to assume that having genetic information means we will abuse the choices it facilitates. And that tells me that having more genetic control through things like gene editing doesn't mean that we are doomed to abuse that power and go down a dark path. So, if that's the case, who decides? Who decides whether parents should have information and the power to make choices, right? Like it or not, when it comes to the conflicts between scientific progress and um, public fear, the power to decide who decides is usually in the hands of the legislature. And I saw this firsthand. I used to work for Congress. I worked for an agency whose job was to scan the future and look at technologies like robotics in the workplace or genetic screening in the clinic and ask what are the societal implications and what should the government do or not do in response. My own work focused primarily on reproductive technologies, like in vitro fertilization. And so we took testimony from people who, as soon as in vitro fertilization emerged in the 1980s, said, we need to stop this. If people have this ability to manipulate and control embryos, they're going to abuse it, and they're going to treat children as the products that they can design and not as real people in and of themselves that we can't trust ourselves and our instincts. But at the same time, we also heard testimony from infertile couples that were simply desperate to have children. And it brought home for me, at that early stage in my own career, the very important observation that there's always going to be a difference between deciding what's right and wrong for the individual and for each one of us and the question of what should be the public policy about what's legal and illegal. In other words, I absolutely <laughs> cannot tell you what's right for you or you or you, even though I've been a bioethicist for 30 years, I've studied biology, I've studied law, I have no idea what's right for you individually. But what I can say is that maybe we need some principles that will inform the kind of policies we adopt that will govern what kinds of choices you and you and you will be allowed to make. And for that, I look to the values that are embodied in the Constitution. First and foremost, the freedom to make decisions for yourself. In a democracy, we try to maximize freedom up to the point that it limits somebody else's freedom. But the Constitution also embodies the notion of a social contract that we are in, in this together, that there is a set of mutual obligations, and that the benefits of science, as well as any burdens it creates, must be fairly shared among all of us, and always with attention to the least among us, and always with an absolute commitment to the inherent dignity of every single person of whatever capacity.
And I see progress in this direction because those same 50 years when we saw genetic tests move along ever more expanding range of possibilities and then embryo selection, every, ever more possible ways to select your embryos, what else did we see that reflected those constitutional values? We saw 50 years of advances in culture and law surrounding how it is that we view ourselves and our capacities. Children who are, have Down syndrome, they are now legally entitled to get the medical care that they require, and they are no longer left to die, nor are other children with disabilities. And special needs children are now legally entitled to the education that they require. And we now have made progress, not enough, but we have made progress toward making the physical environment capable of accepting people of every kind of capacity. And we have started to make real progress in making our workplaces and our schools less discriminatory. In other words, the very same 50 years from the 1970s to now, when we have increased our power to use genetics to make choices about ourselves and our children, are the same 50 years that we have also increased at a cultural level, an ethical level, and also at a legal level, all of our regard and our protections for people at every level of ability, disability, and capacity. So let me go back to the three questions I began with. First, do we really understand the degree to which genetics is essential to our personal identities? At one level, I'd say sadly no, that we continue to overestimate it. But I think if you look at our actions about how we structure our families, what our law says about our families, what our law says about who plays in which teams, I think that in our hearts and our laws, we've actually come to recognize genetics is not as determinative of our identities as we might have thought. And because it has lost some of its power over our identities, it's lost some of its power to cause us to be fearful. Which leads to the second question. Are the fears we've been having realistic? And I'd suggest that no, we've got 50 years of evidence that those fears have probably been exaggerated and that we do need to trust ourselves and one another much more than we do. And last, what is the role of government? For me, this tells me that the role of government, as always, is to make sure that technologies are developed in a way that's ethical and that they're safe and effective, but when it comes to what is right and wrong, those are decisions that are very individual, very intimate, and that it's up to each one of us to approach these technologies thoughtfully, and if we decide to use them, to use them responsibly. In other words, I'm an optimist. I think that we've actually gone beyond simplistic notions of perfection, and I think that we have gone beyond simplistic notions of personal identity. So maybe now it's finally time that we get beyond our fear and accept all of the wonderful benefits that genetic science can bring us. Thank you.